because we've got Dr. Rosie Spooner, who's a ST5 paediatrician, and she's also an education fellow for the, hang on, yeah, the sustainable um, QI, the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. So thank you so much for helping and coming for this, Rosie, thank you. Lovely, nice to, nice to meet you guys. So, um, yeah, that's me. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to turn my video off for the beginning bit, but there are quite a lot of interactive elements to this. So I'm hoping that we can put videos on and come back to it. So um, just a warning, I have two young children, they are going to bed, that can be noisy. So if there is very bad background noise, I will have to go and sort of find out what's going on. <laughs> Um, so, first of all, um, let's just watch this brief video. It's only, it's only two minutes. Yeah. So um, I think that kind of this guy down here, so David Attenborough and, um, and that video sort of sums up a little bit about why I got so involved in this. Um, essentially, I, I kind of felt like it was quite a sort of very important issue and feel like it was as silly for me not to be putting some of my time and effort into thinking about solutions for it. And in this workshop today, I hope that I can help you understand how what we're doing in healthcare can impact on the environment and also work with you guys to think about what we might be able to do to try to mitigate those negative effects. And also, I hope that I'll try and get you all to participate. And there is ways to do that without talking. So hopefully you don't, if you do feel intimidated to be kind of involved in something like that, then there is options not to speak, but yeah. So why, um, why should I talk about this? So I normally am a paediatrician um, and I work in the seven deanery. I've had a, a very diverse and long career. I was, um, I, so far I've done quite a lot of infectious diseases and then I've taken a year and done some tropical medicine and then I've come back and I did a year on a boat with my husband and we sailed across the Atlantic solo and then we came back and then yeah, then I had a couple of kids and now I'm an education fellow. So what does that mean? Um, basically, I was doing my job in neonates and I got quite worried about what the future from a kind of planetary health point of view was going to look like um, unless uh, we took some more immediate action and was quite encouraged by the idea that maybe I could do something to help that. So I joined this organisation called the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare and I've been working there for a year um, and I'm doing this fellowship which is all about teaching quality improvement tools but um, using sustainability as part of that. So what we're trying to do is teach that quality in healthcare isn't quality unless it's a sustained, like it's, unless it takes in the environmental and social impacts that it's having then it isn't really good quality because it will mean that people in the future will be unable to maintain their own healthcare system if the planetary system is so damaged. So um, one of the places I'm teaching is actually at King's and I teach in year four and I think I've done an SSC as well with some students. Um, and what we're trying to do is help people use some tools that they can then implement in their quality improvement projects. And I'm also teaching in loads of foundation schools and basically quite a lot of different places and it's quite fun um 
but also we've helped produce this website so that we can share our resources and because it's a topic that so many people really do care about um, and the NHS has just published a plan to try to get to net zero it is a topic that there's loads of interest in which is really great because it's a really um, so what you you were asking at the beginning Maria or it was Maria asking what we mean by sustainability well um, there's loads of different definitions and one of the things that people say about sustainability is that they get confused about like the longevity of a change so like if something is sustainable um, what one definition that I find really helpful is that it means meeting the needs of the present so meeting who we are today without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs so we don't want to use up finite resources that means that other people in the future cannot have healthy lives and well basically to have a life at all so we want to make sure that we don't compromise that and one way of looking at that is by thinking about the the triple bottom line which is the environmental social and economic factors and if you put those in together sort of in interlooping loops then sustainability is in the middle of that um, and another way of looking at is people planet and profit and that's that should be like the bottom equation of any change that you're trying to make in in policy or in um, public health you want to think about whether you're you know you can't have any of those go away otherwise it won't be possible to sustain it um, so in the long term obviously short term you might be able to do that but in the long term that that isn't sustained change so QI um, if you don't know what QI is it's basically a science of improvement so it's about having this sort of systematic approach um, to improve quality and systematic meaning that you've got these tools that you use to try to make changes so there's this kind of theory of change and lots of people have got lots of different ideas about how change actually takes place um, and in healthcare we borrowed a lot of that kind of understanding from other industries like the aviation industry or the car manufacturing industry and we used a lot of their kind of knowledge to try and build better health systems so mm, are you worried about climate change impacting uh, I don't really need to do that zoom poll but basically most of you I imagine are worried about all of these things you're probably worried about you your patients future generations ability because climate change is a pretty defining health issue issue for um, well, certainly for, for us currently, but definitely for younger people and paediatric patients that I treat, I'm very worried about rapid climate change and that the science that is coming out showing the changes over time is just more and more devastating and very worrying. Um, and that if we are going to limit that change, then um, a lot of what we know is, is going to happen anyway. We are going to see ch rapid changes in temperature, but whether those are two degrees, four degrees or six degrees is really dependent on what we try and do now to try to rebalance our relationship with the natural environment and how we are, you know, how much carbon we continue to release and whether we try to build back forests and make a, a better environment uh, uh, for biodiversity because we depend on the natural world for our food systems our water systems and so we need to have that balance back in place so um there's a really good series called the lancet countdown series which tracks the relationships between public health and climate change and that's really useful because um we can then see things like um zoonotic illnesses or um, increasing heat waves and the connections between air pollution and death and so we need to know what climate change is actually doing to human health and the Lancet countdown series does that based on a country to country basis um, which is really useful. Um, so 10 years ago when I was just leaving medical school um, the Lancet came out with this paper which was saying that climate change is the biggest global threat of the 21st century 
And, you know, obviously I, that was quite a disturbing thing to read. Um, and 10 years later, we continued to release carbon dioxide at unprecedented levels um, globally. Although that said, within the health sector in the UK, we have actually reduced carbon emissions related to NHS. So we have made some really big changes. And what's, what's optimistic about this is that a lot of the changes that need to be made, there, are, there has been massive progress in them. Um, not necessarily only in healthcare, but in sort of other industries like the transport sector or the energy sector. There's loads of changes now, like renewable energy is going to be viable for national grid level. And sometimes it's even producing about 70% of our national energy is from renewable sources already. So that's really promising. I mean, 20 years ago, you wouldn't have thought that that was going to happen. Um, but the Lancet then produced another. Uh, well, its main message from the Countdown series this year was that every child born today will be affected by climate change. So that's not saying maybe it's like this is going to happen. And if you put health at the centre of the transition that we will have to make and you try to define it about health, we can have changes that may lead to healthier diets, safer cities, cleaner air, lots of promising things, but it will take everyone's efforts to to try and do that um so if we want them to have healthy lives my children and the children that i care for we need to be thinking about what we're doing to try and address that so um just some happy news brazil's rainforest suffers the worst fires in a decade which um i mean that's just really depressing isn't it because that's not just releasing carbon it's the carbon sink um this happened in the last two weeks um that two massive storms hit the coast of nicaragua it didn't kill many people but just the damage that that does to a country and that country is responsible for 0.03 percent of carbon dioxide emissions both currently and historically which um it just feels quite unfair that this what we're seeing is often affecting some of the poorest countries of the world so we're not just talking about a kind of intergenerational justice issue but we are talking about a, a global health issue and a global justice issue um and also that children in our countries are losing sleep and having bad dreams over climate change and this phenomenon as it's called of eco anxiety is is a real thing that um makes sense it's you know it is grounded in a reasonable um rational thought process by young people who feel like what's going on and where is our future going so um you know we need to pay attention as pediatricians but also as health professionals to try and address some of those things so we like quantifiable data um i mean we i'm talking about you scientists and health professionals and you can see here that um, these are the parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and um, yeah they're just going up and up aren't they but many of those may suddenly reach these things called tipping points which by whereby um, like massive reserves of carbon dioxide are released all at once um, because like permafrost may melt um, like at the moment, what we know is that in the atmosphere, we haven't been recording the same levels of carbon dioxide that we would expect to be because the sea has been a massive reservoir for a lot of our carbon dioxide in the last hundred years. But then it became has become saturated now. And so we're seeing accelerated growth in carbon dioxide in the in the atmosphere. Now, um, this isn't always going to end badly there are things that can be done and I feel like when you present this kind of data it can be a bit overwhelmingly depressing but um, I think one of the take away messages is that this is outrageous this is awful but we need to be optimistic that we can do something about it because if we're not then um, you know then we're damned we've got to try and change things so um, in my kind of mindset i feel like the first way to do that is to work in the sector that i'm in so one of the things that you know you say when you become a doctor is that your hippocratic oath 
is that you first do no harm. So if I'm not going to harm the patient in front of me, I shouldn't be harming patients generally. So thinking about what healthcare does in terms of its environmental impact means that you can try and mitigate that kind of harm. So in the UK, we produce about 21 million tonnes of carbon dioxide a year uh, from the NHS, and it's about 5% of the greenhouse gas emissions, which is bigger than the um, shipping industry. It's about the same as all of the aircrafts departing Heathrow on a normal year. So you might find that quite surprising. I mean, I find that quite surprising. I was like, I, you know, I, I've heard lots about the aviation industry being a terrible polluter, but I haven't really heard about the health industry having um, responsibility for some of those things. So um, in October this year, the NHS has made this target of delivering a net zero national health service, which is really impressive target. But um, the document that goes around how it's hoping to achieve that does set out a strategy. So it says all of the emissions we directly control, because there's this um, definition between directly controlled emissions and emissions that are um, indirectly influenced by us. Um, so the ones that are in our direct control, um, we hope to get to net zero within 20 years and with a very ambitious target of an 80% reduction by 2028 to 32. And the reason that is so ambitious is because the people who are setting these targets know that if we continue to release carbon dioxide nash like at the same rates that has been happening internationally, then we are set for a three or more degree rise in global temperatures. And that has quite catastrophic effects on biodiversity. And um, in line with the Paris Agreement, this is what we need to do. So for the emissions that we influence, um, we want to get to net zero by 2045, which is an, again, quite sort of ambitious, <laughs> um, um, by an 80% reduction um, by 2036. So yeah, there's, there's two kind of different, that's to do with the, the procurement chain. So all of the things that we buy from overseas, etc. how we can try and help them to reach next zero. So um, how will it do it? This is a really interesting graph. So this is the carbon emissions on the side here that are to do with the NHS. And you can see that we've had a good reduction since we started realizing how important this was, or it came to the attention of people more than it has been. We've had quite a good reduction. So we've sort of been on a downward trend. Ideally, that would be much more downward, but um, you know, we, we are managing to reduce that. But then there's a lot of these things here that still need requirements. So the purple sections here are a lot to do with what the government can do. So uh, electrical decarbonisation, supply chain decarbonisation, vehicle efficiency. So all of these things, things that we don't really have that much control over as health professionals. And then there's things like here, like um, low carbon models of care. Like, what does that mean exactly? Um, and I'll go in a little bit into that and like preventative medicine and paying more attention to that and reducing health inequalities. Um, again, that's quite a kind of broad idea. But then there's things like building efficiency, uh, reducing food waste and shifting to plant based diets. We haven't yet had any NHS trusts that are not serving meat every day of the week. So that would be a change that we might see in the next, you know, five to 10 years, more efficient use of supplies, which is kind of, I think what you were talking about at the beginning, Maria, about how to build efficiency into um, like efficient use of resources is kind of what you're thinking in reducing waste. But if you look at that, that's only a tiny section of the, the target. Um, and then this is suppliers. So all the people who are like pharmaceutical companies and medicine producers of like, uh, products that we use in endoscopy or in theatres if they all agree then we get this massive reduction here and then this is like kind of innovations that we don't even know really how we're going to do that so we're hoping that some miracle idea is going to happen in the next 
10 years or so that was going to really help us reduce. So we're hoping that that will kind of set in by 2024, 25, and then that will help us reduce down. So that's basically how they're intending to do it. We need lots of leadership from medical professionals in this area because this is the bit like shifting to low carbon inhalers, using nitrous oxide, reducing anaesthetic gases. So that's kind of the section that I'm sorting, sort of hoping to work on. And this bit is about innovation and thinking about clever ideas, which is the bit that I'm hoping that you guys can help me with. <laughs> so um, that's just carbon emissions, but also this is the kind of visible stuff that you are probably very much aware of entering hospitals or GP practices or just kind of seeing things for the first time. Sometimes you're just like, really, is that just one operating theatre's waste? Like that's just, yeah, that's pretty nuts. So it's about 2% of the global plastics productions used in healthcare. And it's growing year on year because the demand just keeps increasing. And the NHS alone is about 133 tonnes a year. A lot of that is incinerated. Less than 10% of it's recycled. And just this year, since the pandemic, we've used about three to four billion face masks. That's just nuts. <laughs> it's just insane. Um, so what does it mean to try and understand what this means in terms of carbon emissions? Well, carbon literacy is having a bit of an awareness of the carbon dioxide costs and impacts um, that we're having from our everyday abilities. And I would really recommend this book if you're interested in carbon emissions and your own carbon footprint, but also just about like, you know, stuff that we use and trying to understand what effect that has in terms of carbon emissions can be quite interesting. But carbon is just one part of the story. Obviously, there's a fuller picture of it. This is from the Sustainable Development Unit, which is the NHS's body to try and achieve this net zero target. So it's kind of tried to map out where our biggest carbon impact areas are. So we've got medical instruments and pharmaceuticals up here, which kind of make up about 25% of what we're using. And I think you said at the beginning, Maria, that you just have to use this stuff if it, if it needs to be used. But um, sometimes you'll find in practice that a lot of stuff is being used that doesn't actually need to be used. Um, energy here, so thinking about energy efficiency and what we're using, but actually the NHS has just managed to shift. All NHS trusts have been required to shift to renewable energy suppliers. So that, as a carbon emission factor, will massively reduce. Um, there's some very specific kind of drugs that are very damaging in terms of global warming effect and one of them is um, inhalers which have a propellant inside them which have very high um, global warming potential and some anaesthetic gases just a couple in particular have just a really damaging effect on the atmosphere um, and then waste which is the kind of bit that we were talking about in terms of plastic is actually tiny it doesn't have very much impact so when we think about how we're going to do this, how will we reduce carbon dioxide but keep the health outcomes the same? What can we do? You can do this thing called a driver diagram, which is a way of trying to think about your goal. And um, this was from Frances Mortimer, who um, is the medical director at the Centre for Sustainable Health Care. She sort of sat down, put her thinking hat on and was like, oh my God, how are we going to do this? What are we going to do? So you can either look at reducing the intensity of the products that we're using or reduce the activity of the system as a whole. So what do you do to reduce use of healthcare? Well, prevention, which is sort of, this is just um, applying this to, for example, a surgical patient. You'd make sure that you do everything to make sure they don't have any post-operative pain or um, infections, et cetera, which would mean that the activity of the health system would rise. Um, you empower people so making sure that they are using physio um, activities before their operation make sure that they are fully aware of their the impacts that their operation might have on them for example and then thinking about lean pathways so making sure that you have a streamlined service with no inefficiencies which is where we massively fall down in the nhs because it's such a big organisation, often we get just a bit sort of lost as to what we're actually trying to achieve. And 
I don't know, because of the funding of it, someone funds here and then no one really takes ownership of it. And sometimes you will find that this streamlining isn't like a smooth machine that it could be. Um, and then other things like reducing, choosing a low carbon alternative, for example, for the inhalers that I was talking about. There's two types of halo, one which has got a quite bad uh, impact on greenhouse, like it has a high carbon emission um, associated with its use. And then there's another inhaler called a dry powdered inhaler, which is um, not so bad. <laughs> so we should be kind of trying to use the lower carbon alternative one. And then you can think about like, if you were doing a operation, um, you could try to reduce the intensity of that operation. For example, if you did a local anesthetic rather than a general anesthetic, um, or if you looked at trying to recapture some of the anesthetic gases that we, you were using, then you could prevent them from leaching into the atmosphere and making it a lot hotter. So I've kind of talked quite a lot already <laughs> and now I wanted to try and talk, get you guys to start your videos. Are you there? Let's ask you all to start your videos or unmute yourselves and say hello. Uh, ask, ask more, ask all to unmute. <laughs> unmute yourselves. So, um, so wait, what was I want to go back. So you are med students, right? So you probably feel like this feels like a big, much bigger problem than you and you don't know how to influence or necessarily change something that's so much bigger than you are. Is that right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's that's <laughs> unreasonable to you? Like that feels like that's the way I feel about climate change. <laughs> um, and Just to say, Ruthie, sorry. Um, so we do have some non-med students as well, I think. Okay. Um, Hi, non-med students. <laughs> so, uh, sorry if this is very much medical student focused. Um, so this diagram was quite important. So if you think about Greta Thunberg, like what could she really control in her life? Well, she could control whether she ate meat or whether she took an aeroplane or whether she um, decided to, I don't know, like she, that was kind of what she had direct control over as a what was she 13 years old girl you know she kind of couldn't really see whether she controlled whether she went to school or not that was kind of within her sphere of control but then if you think about her sphere of influence it probably felt like maybe she could influence her mum and dad or like some people that she could talk to but now you would say that she has grown her sphere of influence to be able to talk at the UN, to talk at the um, COP26. She's managed to meet some of the biggest leaders in the world. And so she has grown this ability to make change. And what I think that um, I take from her kind of leadership on this matter was just how inspiring it can be when people actually take something really seriously and decide that they want to change it. And it's not always easy to do that, but um, like my personal journey was that I was doing a lot in my own life, like um, having an electric car, like not flying anymore, becoming a vegetarian and sometimes a vegan. Um, but then I kind of was like, but hang on, I, I'm not really changing anything here. I need to go a little bit beyond myself. So then I went and like looked at my own department in pediatrics. And then I spoke to my department. We started thinking about what we could do as a department. And then I spoke to the chief executive of my hospital and was like, okay, we need to do more. And I like tried to influence them. And I wrote a paper that said they should declare a climate emergency and they actually agreed to, and then they funded someone to become a sustainability officer within my trust. And now they meet monthly and have like this plan of what the trust is going to do to try and respond to climate change. And then I was like, right, well, I feel like maybe my sphere of influence is becoming bigger so then I went to the Royal College of Pediatricians and was like okay I've got a bunch of people who really think that this isn't an issue that you're taking seriously so we took it to their annual meeting and we were like you need to listen to us because this matters it is like not a sideline issue this is the 
defining issue of potentially every child in the world's future we should be thinking about what we're doing as a college to try and address this so then they were like okay yeah you're right <laughs> and then I was like oh okay so then they took that up and they've uh, declared a climate emergency as well and set up a group and have made some targets of how they're going to achieve their goals so I guess what I'm trying to say is that I didn't have that much power but I was able to influence people who are more powerful than me to try to change their own practices and so that was quite a key learning for myself so what I thought was what we could do is let me just go to this well, what I wanted to say was that actually medical students have catalyzed climate change education in the US and they've done loads of really great stuff so we can do more but if I share this in the chat if you open this jam board um, it should be possible for everyone to participate in it but you can write in it and I will open it as well um, can you see it can anyone tell me? I can't see your faces, sorry. Not on your screen. Hello. So, um, that's it on your screen. No, you should be. It's should working. Open, you just open on the chat. Yeah, you shouldn't see it on my screen. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have a look. So, basically, there's three slides here. So, what do you have control over to help build a more sustainable health system? So, just enter like I did. So, there's a little. So, I'll share my screen if you want. So if you, could you see that? No. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. That shared? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so on the side here, you can see like these little sticky notes. So then you just write in the sticky note, like what you kind of think. So what can you control? Like you control whether you fly or whether you're a vegan or whether you use a reusable bottle or like those are like direct choices that you can make you can choose whether you become a doctor you can like these are your life choices you are in possession of those decisions and we can talk about them if someone puts things up have you ever used google jam jam whatever they're called jam boards has anyone used them before they're actually quite good like to okay. capture opinion So I've stopped sharing and I'm hoping that you're going to write in them. Okay, so there's supposed to be 15 people here, but only seven have joined the jam board. What are you guys doing? Ways of traveling, promote active transport. I can decide to attend a workshop to attend what to understand what I can do to help the healthcare system. Yes, that is definitely in your control. That is a choice on your Friday night. Mm -hmm. What else can you control? Mm. Talk about it. Do you, yeah, I suppose you control whether you challenge other people about it. Talking to friends and encouraging actions to reduce carbon footprint. Eat plant based diet. I'd say that maybe that might come under influencing. I mean, you are in control whether you talk to them, but you might think that that would be somewhere you would be influencing. Um, educate myself. Yeah, read. Recycle waste, alternative ways of travel. A lot of these are um, personal based about like your own personal, because I guess that is control. Do you think you have any control about the health system at all? I guess just by like who you talk to, that's kind of like, like surely you need to make it work. You kind of need someone like yourself almost to kind of champion it within your team, within your yeah. ward or et cetera. I see what you mean, like it's not 
you so maybe let's go on to what you can influence because i guess because a lot of you may not be either in hospital like you might not practically be working in hospitals yet um or even on clinical placements so what you can do for that health system aspect is probably still quite limited um but i think it's there's, there's also talking to the medical school and hmm. within that i don't know if that's coming on to influencing now well let's go on to the next slide if you go to at the top and um you can see there's like some arrows what can you influence to help build a more sustainable health system what do you think you have control over i guess you also what can you what can you influence so those things were you already in your control you none of you are head of a trust as far as i'm aware or like you know no like run a service or something so that is going to be difficult for you to be in control of but you can influence a lot of these things because your voice is powerful so um think about the things that you might want to influence or how you think they could have the biggest effect so writing in that bit is sort of good i think i might give you just a few minutes to do that and see what other people have put in as well and if that sparks you is this on the same jam yeah so if you go to the top bit um so at the top of the uh thing there's like a little thing that says one over three and if you just press the little arrow to the oh, side okay. it goes on to the next frame yeah i found it thanks I'm going to download all your ideas because this is going to be really helpful. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, one of those things that you put down about talking to your MP. Um, I guess that is one of our kind of ideas of democracy is that that is one of our powerful ways of lobbying. Emphasize preventative medicine to lower usage where possible, integrate into QI research projects as part of med school. No, it's really great that King's has like embraced this idea that I could like teach in quality improvement. It has been a bit slow because like you have to do this QI module for like a year. So we might as well try and include sustainability in it. Provide sustainable oral health care kits in one package for people in long-term care to promote oral health and reduce waste. Yeah. But how would you, so who wrote that one? I wrote it. Um, Tell me about that. Well, because I'm a dentistry student. I'm not a med student. That's so. fine, yeah. <laughs> um, well, my idea was because usually oral health care really suffers in long-term care patients. It's because, like, fair enough, they're dealing with a lot of things. So one of the least of their priorities is actually oral health care. Mm -hmm. and, and so what would be great is like having sustainable oral health care kits um, that would, you know, contain all the things that you need for like a daily oral health care regimen. So that could be your toothbrush, interdental cleaning agents, um, you know, so that could be floss or something like that. Um, and provide it in such a way where, because, you know, usually a toothbrush comes individually packaged and, and your interdental brushes come individually mm -hmm. packaged and there's a lot of plastic and all of these things. Um, and I'm not too sure as to how oral care is delivered in a hospital, but um, if it's like the nurses who help it, then the question of manual dexterity is no longer an issue because uh, the patient, it's, you know, if the, the nurse must have some kind of level of dexterity. Um, and so then, um, you know, it could be a bamboo toothbrush with like good bristles and stuff. And then instead of having multiple packages, you know, so this also in a way prevents the subsequent or healthcare. Yeah. Like, but how would you go around influencing that as a, making it happen? Like, how do you make that happen? Uh, that's a good question. Um, well, at first, I don't know, because I'm intercalating this year and I think one way is to set up a good business plan and then make way make it make it in such a way where you could get a profit and so then you know once there's a question of profit and stuff then usually the big dogs like to uh 
like to jump on board. It's perfect. It's money. So I don't know. So Come up. I think that if I was approaching it, I wouldn't necessarily go from the profit point of view or like create a new business because actually many of the companies that are doing these things already could be persuaded by a powerful voice that says, look, this is in the interest of the future of the environment. This is in the interest of our patients. If you could kind of produce something like this, we don't need to create a new product. You need to stop packaging. And lots of them have already signed up to pledges to reduce their packaging. Like loads of these supermarkets are like, yeah, we don't want to package stuff because people are demanding that. People are saying stop doing these things. So I think we have an influence as health professionals to sometimes amplify that voice to really kind of say, look, you know, that in sustainable dentistry, we need to be thinking about reducing packaging, um, but also reducing resource waste and making sure that resources are used at the right place at the right time for preventative care. So um, there is something called Sustainable Dentistry Group and a Sustainable Dentistry um, uh, Directory, which um, is on the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare's website. If you look up Sustainable Dentistry and you can download the guide, that's all about like ways in which to make sustainability more like prevalent in dentistry, just like particular. But um, it's a really it's a nice idea and I can see that it could work. It's just sometimes when we have the ideas, it's like, I think it's helpful to then go through the process of maybe a little bit trying to work out where would you go next with this? What do I need next? Okay. What else have we got on here? Signing petitions. Oh, yeah, that one. Um, and protests, you know, these are very contacting MPs. How do we make sure that they lead back to a sustainable healthcare system? I think definitely that links back to kind of being in control about what you know about it. And so making sure that you've kind of signposted and networked in with other people that are influencing. And because the power of that is in often in your number and in your voice as a group, rather than as like one individual person. Although I write to my MP occasionally, she sometimes writes back to me too. She doesn't really, we don't, you know. I live in a Tory place. They don't seem to see eye to eye, but it's fine. I still write to her. Um, so letters to heads of research departments and school departments. Yeah, I think that is a really key thing because if we're going to build a more sustainable healthcare system, everyone needs to be involved, right? We can't just have 15 people who are interested in global health kind of getting into this because this isn't a niche thing. This isn't everything. This isn't everybody thing. Does that make sense? Like we want everyone to be involved because it needs to require everyone to think about solutions and ways of addressing this. So if you can make it a key component part rather than a special study module, that's like helpful. So go ahead, please talk to your med school. Um, and one of the things about doing, talking to med school about quality improvement projects um, is that if you can, if we can get you guys sort of hooked up to, so I were asked actually one of my predecessors who did this job before to hook me up with some King's clinical physicians who would want to have med students who are like doing a project for sustainable healthcare with them. Because what part of what it takes is time, right? And they never seem to have any time. And if you want to be enthusiastic about changing things in healthcare, then having someone who wants to do that is like, a massive asset for them so for example if there was someone in anesthetics who wanted to try to improve their service or someone in endocrinology pretty much any specialty can think about what they can do to improve sustainability so you could look for one of those more senior clinical leads who has a decision making process and offer to help them with like you know your own enthusiasm which is actually a powerful influencer Request to GMC that sustainability is a requirement on curriculum. Yes, that would be great. <laughs> I also think the CQC should include sustainability because that would make a big difference to whether like all trusts, not just my trust, but all trusts are really taking this seriously. They take it seriously when they're given targets by government to do. So that would help support sustainable companies and startups. You can influence that, you can, or you can even create them. Um, the same we discussed benefits of lifestyle choice with patients, we can include health benefits. 
of addressing climate change on social media, we can reach to lots of people. Yeah, I think that's a really powerful thing that we can lead or influence on is through social media. And I think that that is something that um, a lot of people of my generation don't necessarily um, see the benefit of so much. And I do think it's a really key way that you can kind of help to influence things. Um, join or create student organisations? Yes, and there is actually a really great one which I will tell you a little bit about. Um, I'm just looking through some of these. Uh, provide sustainable household protests. Um, compare waste, etc., with other international health systems and see what changes can be made. So I didn't show you a slide about this, but there is a really impressive slide looking at the carbon emissions associated with a cataract done in India, um, like and a cataract. I mean, it's the same operation essentially and a cataract done in the UK in Cardiff and um, the difference is just mental it's like a hundred times more carbon emissions associated with the cataract done in the UK compared to India and that's just the same outcome for patients so what we want to do is not say we don't want to have bad outcomes for patients we obviously want to maintain the same level of care and improve quality even but we just want to try to reduce this negative impact on the environment that we're having does that make sense? And so that goes back to those kind of ideas of sustainable quality improvement that I was talking about at the beginning. This is brilliant. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I'm just seeing what kind of things you've put out. Does anyone want to talk about any of those? Can I ask a question? It's not directly related to these, I don't think. Um, I was wondering, like, how aware I don't know if you know from research like how aware do you think or like other healthcare professionals are and like the public of this because we were I'm integrating at the moment as well along with a couple others in global health and we had a really interesting session the other week kind of comparing like COVID and climate change kind of as like an emergency mm. and obviously they are different but it was saying kind of all about how COVID is you know like suddenly got all this funding like everyone's like on it doing it whereas climate change has obviously been a threat for so much longer and is if not this like just as emergent in different ways but it was kind of like is it just because people aren't uh, not not aware but you know people don't see it as like a tangible thing because it's kind of such a long happens over a long period of time so I was wondering if you thought if people kind of knew more about it especially in the healthcare profession would it kind of suddenly not suddenly happen but I don't know what I'm asking see where I'm going like kind of do you think that's part of the a big part of the issue at the moment is is a lack of knowledge a key component to change yeah no mm. <laughs> so um lots of people know stuff but mm. don't want to change so we all know lots of things that we know are good for us but we don't do right like and lots of times we disobey rules as well because even though we know that those rules might be there for a reason, we choose not to do them. So in terms of change management, like me, I'm like, but why? Why? <laughs> why are we not changing? Like, clearly this is like massively requires us to change. Why, have, why are people not persuaded? So um, if you want to learn more about why people don't or choose not to believe, and I say believe, the climate science mm -hmm. and the effects that this is likely to have on planetary health and, and the relationship between us. The reason people don't do that, there's a really good called, uh, organization called Carbon Briefing. And there's also a series from the TED Talks organization that does really great talks. Um, and you, if you look up TED Talks Climate Change or um, Carbon Brief, um, and we'll, there's another slide on this, which is all about resources that we can share together. Um, there's loads of information about why people can't engage with it. And everyone's gonna have different reasons why they don't want to engage in this conversation. Fear, like don't want to change the status quo, um, denial, you know, loads of the reasons why we all kind of choose not to engage in lots of things that are requiring us to make changes to our lives that aren't necessarily seen in as, as a positive light. Although I would say a lot of the things that I'm talking about are actually quite positive. Not all of them, but you know, a lot of things that we can do, like cycle more and more active for forms of transport, cleaner, cleaner air, like 
and walk and grow trees and be in nature and eat plants <laughs> like they're all kind of quite nice things not like terrible things for us to get involved with anyway um so on the thingy um the jam board thing if you go to the third slide i was i would thought maybe we could just share resources on sustainable healthcare um and i put a few of my own ideas up but um, if you have any that you've been in touch with, I'll tell you a bit through them. So healthdeclares.org is an organisation of health professionals. So mostly, I would say, doctors. But there are some nurses who are involved as well who are campaigning for their royal colleges to divest from fossil fuel investments. So that's like the kind of definite action that we want them to do because we're like, you can't be caring about health and simultaneously profiting from fossil fuel investment it does it can't make sense it's like you can't be promoting breastfeeding and have the shares in a um a, you know a formula company it just it's a massive conflict of interest so um that's one organization for um to kind of get involved in that particularly on those and there's a declaration that you can make if you visit that website. So the UK Healthcare Alliance um, is a body that has come together through loads of different royal colleges and the British Medical Association, and they do loads of really good work. And one of the things that they've done is this green healthcare impact tool, which um, looks at um, GP, it's particularly aimed at primary care, but it came out of this organization called Student Organization for Sustainability, who did that for universities. So they made this impact toolkit and it helps primary care people see where they're having the most impact. I think that's right. If anyone else who put that up and wants to say something about it, you're welcome. Um, this is the Carbon Brief organization, which I was talking about, which does really good podcasts. Um, and podcast is getting hot in here. This is another one. So these these two organisations, Outrage and Optimism. So there was a woman called Christina Figueres who was the like, she was the main delegate who helped to bridge the Paris Agreement in 2015, which is like the only so far global consensus on what we need to do to try to address climate change. So it's like a pretty massive thing to get all the countries in the world, minus America right now but agreeing that this is like a massive thing. So she then went on and has done this podcast, which she does pretty much weekly um, called Outrage and Optimism, which is just awesome to listen to because she's just like, yeah, it is outrageous, but we have to maintain some idea of hope. Otherwise we're screwed. So let's just keep doing it and like fighting for this thing. Um, there's also an organization called the Q Community, which is funded by the Health Foundation. And they do some really great stuff. And then I need to I need to put my one on there. So this is the website that basically I have made since doing this education fellow. I'll just put that like really big one there. <laughs> so that is um, it's called Sus. Thank you. So SusQI, which is Sustainable Quality Improvement um, dot org, which is like a big which is the website which tells you how to do a sustainable quality improvement project um, step by step. So were you ever to have a quality improvement project that you wanted to do, it should help you understand that. But it's also got something really useful on there, which is about measuring the carbon footprint of healthcare resources. So it tells you how to actually understand. So it's in the measurement section, but it, it says measure environmental impacts and it will tell you how like different things how they measure up compared to other things in terms of the carbon tons that they release. And then this organization called SOS, which um, is the Students' Organization for Sustainability. I just, um, you could get, maybe you could approach your uni and ask them to do some work with them to maybe run an SSE, because that's what I've just done with Bristol University. And that was really cool, because um, second year students got placed in GP practices and they did a quality improvement project over three weeks to try and reduce the impact of those practices like in terms of carbon emissions and they were actually able to do some really cool stuff and it was really cool to actually see them do something because I think that you know I hope I haven't like 
uh, overwhelmed you with just the negativity that sometimes it can feel when you're talking about climate change. But um, it's also good to kind of feel like you can connect to something that's tangible. All right, I think that was pretty much it. Let's go back to my slides. Was there anything else I wanted to say? Mm -hmm. I can give you, do you want, before I go, it's been over, it's in the hour, look, uh, do you want me to take you through like a case study of when sustainable quality improvement was implemented? Yeah, and then we'll finish. It's quite brief. That'd be great. So, closing. And then I'm going to go and have a very large glass of wine. <laughs> right, uh, share screen. Okay, so um, this was a project that works. So one of the things that the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare does is something called the Green Ward competition because we know that medics are all really comp competitive. So we like thought, look, if we like make different wards compete against each other, maybe we'll get better results. And it worked. So we did this idea where we identified a problem in each department or they identified a problem, not us. Um, so the ED staff thought that large numbers of patients were being cannulated but the cannulas weren't being used, which means that probably it wasn't appropriate to cannula, cannulate them. So you can see like all the stuff that's used in cannulas and that's not even all the stuff, there's even more stuff that's used. So what they wanted to measure, so when you do quality improvement, you always have to measure stuff, was um, the number of cannula inserted per week and the number of cannula were it used or were not used. And they did this campaign. So they did a teaching session about the environmental impact of cannulas and the detrimental impact on uh, like safe and patient staff and pain and stuff like that and then they also put up loads of posters and they like talk to people so what they did was they did a oh sorry mm -hmm. have you still got it yeah, hopefully so basically they tried to track what happens so patient comes in cannulas inserted was it used or okay was it used appropriately um and then they kind of like put the numbers on each one of these things and worked out what was going on over a week. And then you can also see that they did this thing called a value process map. So they mapped all of the different costs along the way, whether that was anything like ecological, social or financial costs. And they tried to work out where those costs were happening. So they actually managed to see that cannulas were being used um, like lots of times unnecessarily. And they managed to reduce that by 66%. So by two thirds, they reduced the number of people who were just being cannulated and then maybe giving, um, not being used. And each time they cannulated, they also had a bio nectar as well involved. So they managed to reduce the risk of infection because people weren't being cannulated every time. Like if a patient presents to ED, they don't always need a cannula. Um, I think it's just part of culture that sometimes that happens. Um, maybe because that's something that the nurse can do because that's the hierarchy that we're in, that the nurse's job is, okay, triage the patient, cannulate them, take blood, send bloods, but so they don't always need that. And so having some kind of ability to apply some filters <laughs> was kind of helpful. And they managed to save loads of money and save loads of carbon. And they improved like the mobility and independence of patients because they're not hooked up to things that they don't need and they weren't in pain and also lots of you know, they saved time and they improved the work through through their department. Um, and this was down in Devon. So that was quite a like, cool kind of case study. And they had loads of other ideas of what they wanted to do in the future. Um, so when you calculated that cost, that kind of carbon ton saved, you did this by um, calculating the, you had to do it through an emissions factor. And it's not as complicated as it looks, but basically um, you take the emissions factor per pound of medical equipment so it was looking at this you would say 105 fewer cannulas were used per week so 105 times 1.8 because that's the pounds and then times 0 0.3 so a lot of the emissions factors are quite inaccurate but they are trying to be like that you know it isn't very easy to work out exactly the carbon emissions per item 
So the Sustainable Development Unit has made some broad sweeping estimations, guesstimations on lots of these things, but they do allow us to get a sort of generalizable um, ton of carbon associated with it, which is quite useful. Um, and that was just a case study that I wanted to show you. I'm not going to show you all the rest of that, the next one, because it's quite long. And this is the website that I was going to talk about. And this is my take home message. So my take home message is that we need to act fast to try and address climate change. And as a med student, you can influence the med school curriculum, but also as you have identified yourselves, you can influence loads of other things that you have mentioned. Um, but also in your future career, you can impact on healthcare contribution to climate change and you will probably have to do that anyway. So I'm hoping that you, uh, there's this kind of graph of people that change things and there's like this kind of very, it's a bell shaped curve. There's like the, the top bit and you guys are like the early adopters and the people that get it and are going to like influence other people. And then there's like the kind of main body, the kind of sheep that follow the leaders. And then there's like the resistance at the end. So you guys are like going to lead the way and show how we're going to do this. I hope. No pressure. Any kind of questions at the end there? I'm really interested in the stuff you talked about that you're doing at King's um, with the four fears and QIs and stuff. So are we able to do specific projects and stuff to do with sustainable QI or where is that mm -hmm. yeah. So what it involves is Cindy Seppi, who is the like QI lead at King, has allowed me to do a lecture about sustainability and then offer my time um, once a week to help students who are doing a QI project include sustainable healthcare principles in that. So like my understanding is that you don't often get to choose your QI project in your fourth year. Mm. You're given a QI project. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> and sometimes they're really crap <laughs> like I have to be honest like I was like really like that's what you guys have got them doing like a couple on coding I was like come on like this is their opportunity to really improve quality and what you're doing is getting them to earn more money for the trust by coding things correctly when actually like is that really about you know I mean just a bit disappointing <laughs> <laughs> you know it could be a lot more inspiring and exciting in terms of patient outcome and like that would be nice to see right that you're contributing mm -hmm. to a service to make it better but yeah that is basically all that I can tell you about that but if you approach Cindy when you start your fourth year and I'm like you know this QI project that I'm going to do, like I really want to improve sustainable, I want to include sustainable healthcare principles within it. Have you got anyone who's particularly interested? She may be able to help you, but okay. so far I'm not sure she's got full buy-in to my theories. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of us who are going to be starting for you next year, so maybe we can see if we can get in touch with Cindy. Oh, yeah, I had to do a whole review of the Keats material. Really... And don't blame me that the guy is called Alan and it's a hand washing project because that is not my idea of a cool QI project. Mm. Alan mm. and his hand washing. I'm like, come on. <laughs> um, I guess we've got that to look forward to next year. <laughs> yeah, just wait. Any other questions? Great, really nice to talk to you. And that I won't get rid of what's on that sheet there. So if you do want to make any comments, that please go ahead and please get in contact. I think my details were on, if you want me to put those up again or put them in the chat, you're welcome to follow me on Twitter or to get in touch with me. If you want to do any sustainable QI projects and are super keen, then I can see if I can find anyone who would like to do them with you. Great, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Rosie. Bye. No worries. Um, before everyone else leaves, I have a feedback form. If you could please, please, please fill it out. Um, that would be wonderful. Oh, it please pass it on to me, Maria. Okay, sure. When you, like, I mean, when you get the feedback, let me know <laughs> what the feedback says. I will do. Um, and yeah, I hope you guys gained as much as um, I did from the event. And the next event is the WHO event, which is next week, Rebecca, remind me, 4th? 2nd? 
Yes, it's next Wednesday at 5.30. I'm going to be having a panel discussion uh, sort of talking about the WHO responses to the pandemic and what the future might look like. So it should be really interesting. Yeah, there are some pretty cool speakers coming along. So I hope to see you guys there, especially now that I've seen your faces. <laughs> um, nice. Have a lovely evening and a great weekend. Bye. Thanks so much for joining everyone. All right. Where's that chain?